Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's podcast is brought to you by Leaders Credit Union. Emily, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, as usual, before I introduce today's guest, what is something you have discovered? Let's see today. What's something you discovered this morning at Discovery Park of America? This morning, I discovered as I was looking through our guidebook that Tennesseans in World War I, over 130,000 of them served during the war. So that's nearly 6% of the population, which is why we have our nickname, the Volunteer State. Very nice. That is that is excellent information. And you mentioned the guidebook. If somebody's planning a trip to Discovery Park or if they uh, have come and want to learn more, the, the guidebook is a great way to get uh, get the inside scoop on what's going on. So uh, I highly encourage people to get that before, during, or after their visit. You can get it on Amazon. You just search Discovery Park of America, um, and you can find it there. Now, speaking of books, today's guest has just published a book, which we're going to talk about, but he's also a super fascinating guy who has a lot of irons in the fire. They say, if you, if you want something done, ask a busy guy. Well, this is a busy guy today. We have Dr. Frank McKean, president of the West Tennessee Healthcare Foundation, who just pushed who just published a book called Let Me Tell You a Story, Finding Hope in a Hopeless World. I cannot wait to hear more about his book. Welcome, Frank. Good morning. Good to be here. So so back us up a little bit. Tell me a little bit about where you grew up and how did you end up in West Tennessee? I grew up in the mule capital of the world, the dimple of the universe, Columbia, Tennessee. And uh, when I was in high school uh, at Columbia Central High School, they restarted Mule Day. And so here we were high school students and going, who would ever come to a thing called Mule Day? And now 250,000 people come every year to Columbia, Tennessee to watch some mules walk down the road. Uh, even when, when I was in high school and they, ha- they have the Mule Day Queen and it was my friends, you know, the, you know and, and so they'd be crowned the Mule Day Queen and I'd go, I go, is this really an honor? <laughs> You're the <laughs> mule day queen. And the king was always a mule. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then that, that tradition carries on, and it, it was all the way back to the 20s and the 30s, and they just kind of reactivated it as a thing that communities do. So people just pour into Columbia <laughs> from mule day. Well, and you and I have uh, discussed this in the past that um, my dad, you know, w- attended Mule Day faithfully for decades and that my, my daughters grew up riding in the Mule Day parade. And uh, I've, sat, I've sat there in Columbia many times waiting for that long, long, long parade to yes. go by. And it was, I think, the first Saturday or second Saturday in April so it, and there may be times it was very, very cold, but, you know, people would stand out there. Every civic group would be, you know, cooking hamburgers, doing all the things that they do as a fundraiser on Mule Day. So it was a big deal for Columbia. And we, get, we would get out there super early so that we would have, you know, get close and get a parking spot and, you know, but it was great, great times. And so it's a great event. A lot like a lot of the rural communities will have, you know, a festival that sort of they hang their hat on. Um, and then Columbia is also the hometown of James K. Polk, right? K. Polk. And he moved to Columbia when he was, I think, 11. And the, the entire country was like 40 years old. So here they come from North Carolina and and the Polks, his dad, they they bring all their kids. I think there are 11 of them and they live on the, the Duck River right there. Help start Murray County. They arrived before there was a Murray County, before there was a Columbia. And um, 
Right. Anyway, it's just really when you go back and think about James K. Polk being one of our presidents, and you really look at what was going on, it was a it was a big deal for you to leave North Carolina where there's civilization and come where there's a creek or there's a river, and that's the extent. He was one of the first enrollees of uh, the Murray County school system. So, it, you know, it had to be kind of small and it, it may have been his mother teaching it. So it, it just, and his brothers and sisters may have been the entire school system. Yeah. That whole area is rich with uh, Tennessee history. Uh, mm-hmm. So what did your parents do when you, when you were little? My dad trained Tennessee walking horses. So he, for a while he trained at, Haynes Haven, which is the now the site of GM that makes electric Cadillacs, I believe. And there's this beautiful rock horse barn there. And um, and then on Duplex Road in Spring Hill, which is in major, lots of people live on Duplex Road now. It's just a tiny town back then. And then we bought our own farm and moved the operation to the big city of Cross Bridges, just outside of Columbia. And from there, we spent every Friday and Saturday night in some community at a horse show. So it was a great way to grow up. And, you know, you work for your dad. Uh, you, you never got a, an allowance. You got to eat. And that was his you know, response, as many parents were at the time. But it was a neat way. We'd have birthday parties on the farm when my brother and I would have a birthday. And so you get to come to, to our farm and ride a world champion. That was the that was the big thing. So uh, that was a nice thing to do that most kids did not do. So and a lot of the people that listen to this are from all over, and so they may not really have a good grasp of what exactly is a Tennessee walking horse. Can you give us a a real basic primer? During the time uh, of the old South, you had plantation and plantation owners. And they wanted a horse that they could ride that would be, have a smooth gait so that if they were traveling to the back of the farm, and it could be thousands of acres, that it would be a smooth ride. And so they bred this horse um, uh, with the standard bred and, a, and I forget the other, other type of horse so that the, the gait would be smooth. And as they continued to breed the horse, it became a show horse as well. And so they exaggerated the, it's an exaggerated pace. And so you'd have a big front end on your horse and the the back end would go up under the horse. So it was just a very exaggerated uh, walk that the horse would do. And, you know, when we would take friends to the horse shows, they would pick the winners based on the ribbons in their hair instead of the, what their feet were doing. But it, the, the Mid-South had a lot of horse shows, and it was a fun way to grow up. And you're, you become very competitive because uh, my brother and I, you're, you're going every weekend one or two places to try to win. And so it was a, it was a neat way to grow up and customer service because you – you served your dad's customers. And so you're trying to make them look as good as they could perform as well as they could. And so you learned that early on that food on your table was based on how you served your, your public. And so is, is, um, I know there's a annual show in Germantown, Tennessee. Is that like the biggest one? It's in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Shelbyville. That's right. Yes. That's right. And it's the celebration, the Tennessee Walking Horse National Celebration started in 1939. I went to Freed Hardeman. And the interesting thing that I found out that N.B. Hardeman for years as a young gentleman had walking horses. And he was one of the first three judges, had three judges. And so the president of the college uh, judged the first celebration in Shelbyville. And I thought that is the coolest thing. Yeah, that's very cool. I love going to horse shows. Um, Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. So, so was your mom um, a a domestic engineer or did she work outside the home? She was, but she worked outside the home. (laughs) (laughs) She worked for Bell South. And so when we would get out of school in junior high school, we would walk down at Whitthorn, walk down to her office. And at that time, Bell South had this big round it's as big as a room, but it had all these books. And so 
when we got out of school, most folks were, most of the work was done. And so we played with this big thing that would turn. And so I'm sure they were not welcome to see us because here were these little junior high school kids playing with their technology. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun for us, maybe not for them. Um, but mom retired from Bell South. So, so you obviously had a, a really interesting childhood. At what point did do you feel like you started uh, hearing stories and, uh, you know, who played a role in, in the eventual person who could write a book about stories? I guess I would just be very inquisitive with my grandparents and my grandmother. When I was a little kid, I would try to stay on the farm with them all I could because it was just fun. They had a lake and we had, we had kittens and didn't have a dog. I don't know why we didn't have a dog. But my grandmother would take the family albums and she would test me like, who is this person and what is this picture and who is this person and, and what are they doing? And so I grew up with a grandmother that was instilling in me our family and our family history. And so I would ask them, like I asked my grandfather one day after my grandmother had passed away, I would go and visit him when I was back in town. And so one day I said, Papa, how did you meet Nanny? And he said, um, we, were, we were going to see where he was raised in Yokely, Tennessee. So how did you meet Nanny? And he said, well, one night I was walking down the street of Yokely and I saw this porch with these three beautiful ladies on there. And I decided I would walk over there and speak to them. And so he was talking to them when Mr. Hobbs came out <laughs> of the house and said, I don't know who you are, but young man, you better never come back here again. So my great grandfather ran him off because he was a little improper. And then he sent someone back with a note to my future grandmother that said, will you marry me? And she wrote on there, yes. So he came back and got her and they ran off and got married and the family disowned them. And so Papa was telling me and he said, so we found a place to live and I found a place to work. And he said, one day I was out, I think working in a garden and this man came down the road with a mule. And so he walked up to my grandfather and said, are you Wilson Lovell? And he goes, yes, I am. And he said, um, here's a mule for Mr. Hobbs. You're back in the family. And he left. And so with that, my grandparents were disowned and at some point later on, put back into the family. And, uh, and so from there, you know, church became important with them and, uh, they were very, very strict. I say strict. You, you couldn't If one grandparents, you could go play in the fields and, and the cow paths and throw rocks in a lake. The other one, you had to take your baths, do your homework. And so I stayed with the ones that, with the lake the most. And my brother stayed with the ones that you couldn't scoot around on the floor and all these rules that you couldn't do, but they were wonderful people. And, and we, we learned a whole lot about life from our grandparents. I love the names uh, that uh, Southerners call their grandparents. What were the other set called? Yeah. Nanny and Paw Paw and then Berth and Daddy Mac. <laughs> oh, my, my grandma, her name was Bertha, but we called her Berth, B-E-R-L <laughs> and Daddy Mac, John McMean. Yeah, that's awesome. I had a, a daddy bow and a granny and a papa <laughs> and a grandmama. <laughs> so what was the daddy bow? Daddy? Yeah, daddy bow. He, he was uh, Bo Williams. His name was really okay. Lloyd, but they called him Bo. And for us, he was daddy bow. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool name. Yeah. And they were all rural, just like, you know, just like what you're talking about and very different. You know, they were only five miles down the road, but very different. And you're right. It is interesting how uh, grandparents played such an active role you know, in all of our lives, you know, during that time and earlier. My, my grandmother, Berth and Daddy Mac, uh, I asked her how she met Daddy Mac. And she was, um, and this is combining my grandfather's story and my grandmother's story. Uh, Daddy Mac told me that in, back in his day, 
you would go and you would work on someone's farm. And if you were dating the their daughter, then you would stay at their house because you're it's all out in the country. And and so you would work for the future father-in-law and eat at the table, you know, do all that stuff. And he said, one day I woke up and I looked out and my horse was in a different field. <laughs> and he said, that meant that I was no longer welcome in the house and I was not going to be marrying their daughter. Nothing was ever said. He got up, he got dressed and he got on his horse and he found another family. So he went to this family, which were the Taylors and started working and they had uh, several daughters. And my grandmother said they were fixing lunch for the workers, which included my future grandfather. And she looked around the corner and she saw Daddy Mac. And she told her sisters, I'm going to marry him. <laughs> sure enough, they did. And so, oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so your, your childhood was filled with a lot of stories. Did you, um, when your grandmother passed, were you the one who ended up with the photographs to take care of for the family? It went to my cousin who loves stories. And she, she kind of keeps the, she's the keeper of the family legitimate history where I have stories. Um, she has the, the, the family tree all the way back to when the McMeans came to America in 1600. And uh, when um, Haywood Taylor was wounded in the civil war, she has all those records of stuff. And, um, I, I've got to tell you this one story about my grandparents, Burf and Daddy Mac. They went to get married at a Methodist preacher's house. They're riding in a buggy with a horse and it started raining. And so they went under a bridge where the creek was, but they got under there so they wouldn't get wet. But my grandmother, Burf said, and we ran over an egg and it mashed it in the ground, but it didn't break the egg. And I was like, that was the strangest thing to tell your grandchild. But I just remember her telling me about they ran over an egg and it didn't break the egg. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. My grandmother was the same way. I have so many stories in my head. Um, I, I was one thing I did that I really am grateful that I did. And if anybody out there is listening, they should do this as well. Uh, before my maternal grandmother passed away, I got her to sit and go through her entire photo album and I videoed her and she told wow. story after story and pointed people out. And I videoed the, you know, I go back and watch that every once in a while. So I'm really glad I did that. Um, when, go ahead. I was going to say, when I, when I talked to my dad in Columbia, I try to help him or I, I want to ask him questions about either his growing up or, or people that I know that are still alive in the horse business. That is 88. Most of the trainers of his era have died. And so whenever I find someone that has a, a connection to his period of time, um, and there are a few that are still around, and I try to pick his brain about things, about things I remember that and I ask him about. And I think it just, it tickles him that someone is asking him these questions about things that most of the world might have forgotten, but there's something that allows him to start talking about those. And it's, you know, before he won his first world championship and uh, about horses and, uh, and, and things when we bought the farm, it was, a, it was really rocky. And so my brother and I, will give him a hard time that he would put a wagon in the middle of a field. And when we got home from school, we were to pick up rocks and put them on the wagon. And so we filled up this wagon a couple of times. And so we were kidding with him one Sunday afternoon at the farm. And we're talking about working so hard, picking up those rocks. And dad showed us these rock walls that he'd built it. We've always seen them. He said, that's your rocks right there on that wall. <laughs> that's work. great. Yeah. I, is there a Tennessee walking horse museum? Yes, it's in, um, um, not Lynchburg, um, but maybe Belfast. They need, it's a to get, uh, they need to video him and get his story down on, on tape. Yes, that, that would be cool. I'll send him an email. Um, okay. so, um, 
what tell me a little bit about when you first started thinking about getting some of these stories that you have down in a book well i had heart surgery almost two years ago and so <clears throat> when you're when you're about to go through heart surgery you begin to face the fact that when i go under there you know they're stopping your heart they're they're disconnecting you with world, the world for a while and there is a chance and they tell you this that you may not come out the other side and so one sunday afternoon it was the middle of covid and so we weren't allowed to go <clears throat> a lot of places but i had this uh, a, a torn heart valve and so we had to deal with that and so the sunday before the surgery i was watching church on my phone and and i was really moved with with the worship and the singing <clears throat> and so when church was over i lost my mom uh not too long before had we had covid i was about to have heart surgery so it was a very sobering time and so i just went into this depression about that i might not make it and and so it was about two hours i was sitting in in front of the front window looking outside and just crying. And after about two hours of that, I came out of this depression and I was ready for anything. And so whatever happened that day, I went and had surgery. And then there was about several months of recovery. I stayed at a friend's house that helped me during those difficult times when you just getting up out of bed is a hard time. And when you have heart surgery, some difficult times, then I was able to stay at my house. And then I began to think about spiritual stuff and um, just started writing stuff down and would get on Facebook. And these stories became stories on Facebook. And so and they would be very long. And but then there were people that were like, they were moved by the stories. And the president of University of Memphis, Dr. Shirley Raines, she said, you need to put these stories in a book. And I thought, I don't know how you do that. I don't know people that do that. And so she just was very insistent. And, and so I began to talk to some folks that who had written some books and you know, we found a publisher and I said, what does it take to do this? And are these stories worth worthy of being in a book? Um, so long story longer <laughs> we just began to compile these stories and i kept writing and and this book came out and and so it deals with some things that i felt was highly important about we sometimes think that god doesn't accept us or want us because we've done something or we our lifestyle has not been what we think might be good or been through divorce or all kinds of things that, that we create in our brain that God doesn't love me. And so most of these stories are about trying to help people understand that whoever you are and wherever you've been, you're God's child. And we've been led astray because God loves you. And, and I don't know how spiritual we want to get in the story into this in this podcast. But my thinking is that our concept of God is incorrect. And we use an, a Leviticus or, a, a you know, Exodus and all these old uh, Old Testament concepts to picture God and. And I, my thoughts are, we see God when we see Jesus, because he is God. And God sent Jesus to show us who he really is. And all these things were help, helping us to get to a point. It's like the Mississippi River. When you look at the Mississippi River, there are times when the river goes off and you have the main current, but there are these smaller little eddies that, that things just kind of go around and around, and they may be needed for the Mississippi River, but if you get off into one of those eddies, you're just going to be there a while. And I think oftentimes with 
with God, we think that, you know, God, when he said, do not eat shrimp, you know, or, or, or things with, with hooves, you know, those things, that's not for us. That was for, that's a little eddy on a great big river. And when you get into the middle of the river, that's the love of God for his people. If you get off over there, you're going to be there a while. And it's going to, it's not the Mississippi river per se. It's just a little thing over here that collects trees and stumps and twigs. And it's just a mess at times. But if you stay on the full current of the Mississippi river, you see the love of God. That's a brilliant God, way to put it. I've never thought of that. That's, that's a great way to put that. And that God never, ever has not loved his people. He's dealt with things that had to be dealt with because of cleanliness, of things that we need to know, and dealing with, like, how does God wipe out groups of people? Well, that's something for a time, and we may not fully know all of that, but if you get back into the Mississippi River, it's all about the love of God and his people. And so this story, this book, is a collection of stories that help helped me put in word fashion God's love that he tells us time and time again uh, through the stories of Christ. That, and, and sometimes we refuse to accept those stories, but we sure do go back to Leviticus. And we sure do go back to uh, stoning a woman caught in adultery. Shoot, just leave the guy alone, just stone the woman. And... And Jesus began to address all these things. And we still at times don't want to accept that. And we don't want to accept certain types of people. So when I go to church, every Sunday, I will post something about church and tell, um, and tell a little something that God, whoever you are, wherever you've been, you are welcome here at this church at this service, and if you need someone to sneak you in because you don't feel worthy, <laughs> I'll come and sneak you in and sneak you out. <laughs> but it's the concept that we think that we are not worthy at times. I have friends that are not worthy of church. And it's, no, it's the exact God wants you to know that you are welcome in his presence. And uh, the story of of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery and uh, where, you know, Jesus, she sinned. The law says she should be stoned. And eventually Jesus says, yeah, let's stone her. She deserves to be stoned. But those of you in this crowd who have never sinned, you throw the first stone. And it's interesting to see how the people left the scribes and the Pharisees that came to accuse this woman and try to trick Jesus, they began to leave in a certain fashion, the Bible says. The oldest left first, which makes me think they're going, you know, that's the truth. You know, I've sinned. Is one sin worse than another? And they began to quietly just disappear. And the youngest were the last ones to leave where they're going. Surely there's a way I can figure this out. And eventually they left. But they, when they left, there was a great crowd of people there that Jesus had already been teaching that day who got the most powerful lesson about people who are struggling with problems in their life. And Jesus said, I'm not condemning you. You, you can live better than this. Go out and, and be who you're designed to be. And it's just like us every day. There are times when I'm not what I'm meant to be. And he's like, I get that. You're human. That's what humanity is. And that's the book is to help people find hope when Christians and the world is like, no, you're not worthy. Yeah, I think that's especially uh, meaningful and relevant today more than ever to to use something that people say all the time. But I truly uh, believe that you know that we're in a very difficult era that we're all living through. So I think this is especially relevant to that. I also like the way you use some secular stories and turn them around and tie them into 
you know, a uh, spiritual or faith-based message. Uh, what are some of the other uh, stories that are in the book that someone might be surprised by? The, the first story, I get, I get teary-eyed when I, when I either tell these stories or read these stories. Uh, the first story is about a little lady called Miss May. Miss May, when I was a little kid, she was an old, retired, white-haired, short, retired teacher. Taught every, I think she taught every elementary school kid in Murray County at one point in her life. She was loved by everybody. And so one day she went and wanted to buy a car. And so she had a friend that sold cars named Wimpy Jones. Wimpy uh, sold cars, was loved by the community. Uh, Wimpy's son, Boyd, was one of my best friends. And so she went to Wimpy and said, I want to buy a car. He says, great. We're the Chevrolet dealership. We got cars and we got lots of cars. And he said, what car would you like? And she goes, I think I'll take this one. <laughs> it's just a car. And he goes, you know, we got lots of other cars. I'll take this car. Can we test drive it? And so they get in the car and they go test driving it. And they go down the Pulaski Highway. And Miss May pulls over into a field and turns off the car. <laughs> it's the strangest thing in the world. She turns off the car and Wimpy's like, what in the world? And she goes, Wimpy goes, Miss May, are you okay? And she goes, I'm more than okay. I'm, I want to talk to you. And this is the only way I knew how to talk to you and get you away from family and friends and coworkers is to buy a car and to get you in this car. And I want to talk to you about being a Christian. You're a good person to be a Christian because your wife needs a Christian husband and your son needs a Christian dad. And he got teary eyed that somebody cared that much about him. So he looks at her and goes, Miss May, do you really want to buy a car? And she said, I don't really need a car, but today I'm buying a car. So she bought a car she didn't want, she didn't need, but she she did that. Well, years down the road, Wimpy came to our house. And, you know, Christians like to convert people. Well, they tried to convert our family for years and years. And um, in our, our religious group, they had these film strips that told the history of the Bible and stuff. And so as a kid, they would come, we'd turn off the lights, and they'd start showing these film strips. Well, my brother and I would fall asleep. So, you know, they'd come, you know, every couple of months and show a film strip, we'd fall asleep. And my parents were just very gracious and they'd thank them and they'd leave and nothing ever happened. And so uh, dad and Wimpy were horse friends. Dad trained them, Wimpy owned them, uh, had colts. And so he came and said, I want to come by your house one night. And so he did with one of our best friend's dads. And they just, or Wimpy told the same story about Miss May. Frank, that's my dad's name. Uh, your kids deserve a Christian, a Christian father. And your wife deserves a Christian husband. You're one of the best people I know. And so uh, anyway, I want you to think about this. And my dad said, you know, I want to do that. And so that night, Miss May came to our house when she, she'd already passed away. And so that story, a little more eloquently, is told in this, it's the first chapter. And I read that and it just, it touches me with how people love you and they'll do things for you. And that story of, of Wimpy and Miss May uh, lives on. Have you thought about uh, doing an audio version of your book? Well, once again, I'm so new to this <laughs> that I don't, I would have to have some kind of direction and, and it'd be like, so would people want to hear these stories that you would have an audio, audio book? So I would I'd, say, I would say yes. Um, so, uh, cause that, it, you know, it's intriguing that you've written them down, but it will also be great to hear you reading them, uh, in your own voice. So, 
you know, I, cool. I think that would be interesting. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, I want to find out a little bit more about the book and also about the other things you're doing, because you're doing some really cool stuff uh, in addition to the book. So we'll be right back. With nine branches in West Tennessee and nationwide ATM and branch access, you can take leaders with you wherever you go. From checking accounts, credit cards, home loans, and their state-of-the-art mobile app, Banking with Leaders can help you move forward. Learn more and see how you can qualify for membership at leaderscu.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast catcher of choice. And now let's return to Dr. Frank McKean. Uh, so, Frank, the doctor is a recent addition, correct? It is. And uh, it's a six-year-long forever process uh, I'd always wanted to get a, a, a doctorate, but then I didn't have a lot of options because um, I had to finish a master's degree. And I had three attempts of that because I'd be working at Fried Hardeman or working at Columbia Academy or working at Fried Hardeman. And I was traveling, so you couldn't go to class. You know, it was just, we didn't have online stuff then. And so anyway, finished my master's degree and uh, University of Memphis began a doctoral program in Jackson. And I had about 20 friends that were doing it. So we started a cohort and the, the alpha cohort. And so we were the, the, we were the guinea pigs of a doctoral program. And I think it, it lasted six or seven years. And anyway, I just finished my dissertation and um, walked in, in the middle of COVID and um, the stadium in Memphis and nearly froze to death. And I thought, I've worked so hard to get here. I'm going to freeze to death, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to do this. So it was a, it was a neat experience and uh, glad to have finally gotten there. <clears throat> what was your uh, uh, thesis or your whatever they call it? My dissertation was... Dissertation, that's it. <clears throat> it was on the sustainability of the... of. Nonprofit private schools in rural West Tennessee. We have 20 rural counties and we have 12 nonprofit private schools. One out of every five, every five people in West Tennessee are living in poverty. So you've got to try to match what the public schools are doing and raise money for the operation of the school and then find people who will pay tuition. So you have 20 counties and a good section of that, those populations are living in poverty. So you've got to raise money and, and find people that can pay for tuition for those schools. And so how do you sustain a nonprofit? And, uh, and it, I mean, we, I can keep going on that, that topic. <laughs> and uh, no, I'm sure it's, uh, it was uh, very enlightening and, you know, it was uh, certainly a worthwhile uh, endeavor. Were you finished working on that before you started the book or did you do them both simultaneously? Well, I was I was winding up my my dissertation and all the processes. It takes forever once you finish and you submit your your concept and you do your research, then you start writing and you're working with your committee. So that just takes forever. And then when you finish it and you get it approved, it still takes forever because you've got to go through all these processes again. It's very academic. And so um, I was able to get that done and then have the heart surgery. And then that's what prompted me to, to, to keep writing. And, and so the book came shortly after the, uh, the heart surgery. The book came after the heart surgery, which came right after the dissertation. And then you've also got a day job. I do have a day job. Yeah, you're the president of the uh, West Tennessee Healthcare Foundation. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about what that does. We are a community foundation that's between Memphis and Nashville. And so we work with uh, healthcare needs of our community. We work with the arts and um, uh, those that may not have a voice. And we, we try to meet needs in the community that are not currently being met. We've grown from <clears throat> a little over $250,000 in assets 
see now we're a little over, we're almost at $55 million in assets. The majority of which, and this is important for, in, in my mind, the majority of which is in our endowments. There, there are two types of, this is, I always say this, there are two types of nonprofits. There are struggling nonprofits, and then there are endowed nonprofits. And so it's like, if you want to be sustainable, you've got to have an endowment and you've got to have a bit large enough that it keeps you going. And um, my first job out of college, I was a campus minister and the, the place had nearly closed. And so I, I took the job not really knowing what it needed. And so I started to work and it came time to get paid. And they said, well, we need you to go out and raise the money that you're going to be being paid. And so, oh, I did not know this. And so had to go out and find churches to support us. And so we got, we got our support. And so we grew and we became the campus organization of the year. And then I left there and came back and worked at Freed Hardeman where I'd graduated from three years earlier. And I went back to speak at a church in East Tennessee. And I asked about how the student center was doing. And they said, well, it closed. And I said, we had just gotten it to where it was financially viable and successful and, and students involved. And they said, well, the board hired a guy that couldn't find a job. And so it, it broke my heart. So my philosophy is uh, work with the foundation to where you can't screw this thing up. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's sustainable for the long term. So three fourths of our asset base are endowments. And so that will keep the thing going. And so hopefully we'll keep growing and it just becomes a, a larger, more sustainable organization for years. And then before we go, I, I definitely want to ask you about uh, how you uh, buy old homes and how you like that aspect of history as well. Obviously, from our discussion so far, you're passionate about history. Tell me about how that ties into architecture. Well, my my move into old homes was by accident. <laughs> it just it it just everything was always an accident. One day I was living in North Jackson. And I worked at Freed Hardeman in Henderson. So I would drive around the bypass and um, go to work, come home on the bypass. And one day I thought, I'm just going to drive through downtown and drive all the way through Jackson on, on Highland Avenue. So I was driving and, you know, not really thinking about much. And I saw this house, a for sale sign. It was a, a very old house. And so I turned around pulled in the driveway, got the phone number of the, of the realtor, called him, set up an appointment. By the way, I was backing out of the driveway and the telephone pole was real close to the driveway. So I sideswiped the, the <laughs> telephone pole, my first visit of this, this old house. So he came back and we looked at the house. The, the family had died in the house or died and the, the parents had died and the, the kids just kept it. And so they just locked the doors and, and it became like a little museum to their parents until they became old and it was in bad shape. And so they put it on the market. And so I was talking to the realtor and I said, can we come back and look at it again another day? And he goes, I tell you what, nobody wants this house. How about <laughs> if I just give you the key and you come look at it whenever you want to? And I thought, sure. So I bought this house for twenty thousand dollars. Wow! Two story brick house, uh, three bedrooms, two baths, built in uh, eighteen ninety, and and it's like I would go in there and look at what do I do to this thing. So I bought it. I sold my truck so I could buy this house, and anyway, bought the house and renovated it. And I needed a bigger backyard, and so next to me was this rundown Victorian house that had a backyard that was bigger than mine, but it was like two backyards. And so I thought, I'll just buy the back half of that and the guy can keep the front half. And so I would see him in his yard. He didn't live in, nobody lived in this house. And so I'd talk to him about buying the backyard or a portion of the backyard. And so finally one day we were talking about it and he said, well, why don't you just buy the whole house? And I said, well, I really don't want a whole house. I said, well, what would you take for the house? And he goes, 
oh, I don't know, $7,500. So I'm like, <laughs> what? And so that's what I was going to pay for the backyard. So I go into my house because I told him, I said, oh, I don't know. You know, that's a lot of money. <laughs> <It was just laughs> and so I went into my house and I called my banker. I said, Kevin, I want to borrow $20,000. And he goes, for what? And I said, I want to buy another house. He said, you want to buy another $20,000 house? And I said, no, I want to buy a $7,500 house <laughs> and then put this other money in it. And he goes, are you serious? And I said, no, I really want to do this. And so I bought this house and just by accident, because I wanted it anyway, bought another house and bought another house. So uh, I'm now on my 12th house that, um, that people will go, you know, why don't you buy my mother's house? And <laughs> I, I don't want another house. And then I walk in the house and it's like, this has so much potential. So I would <laughs> buy houses by just by accident. And so the la- this last house, not the one I'm living in, but the one I'm working on, I've always liked it. And so I was ready to go up and just knock on the door and say, can I buy your house? Because it was just this, in Midtown Jackson, it was on a, it's on three lots. And so, and it was a beautiful, kind of a Frank Lloyd Wright style house. And so bought it and started working on it, then had heart surgery. And so I'll get back on that house soon. So we're 12 houses into this, this city. I'm uh, I'm seeing the potential for an HGTV uh, series uh, here for you. If you had talked to me 30 years ago when when all this started happening by accident, you know, <laughs> now it's like I'm tired. <laughs> so speaking of being tired, what's next for you? I know that you finished that book, and so you're, you're probably taking a little bit of a break, but surely there's something turning turning up there for the next book. Well, I. I'm starting to figure out how, because I've renovated my house that I added a bedroom in case my dad needs to come and live with me, that he can have access to a bathroom that's easy and no steps. And and so what used to be my office is now, uh, I took a a bedroom and turned it into a closet because the master bedroom didn't have a closet. So I turned one into a closet. And so now that's my office and a closet. And so um, I'll, I'll start writing again. And, and so there may be a, another one of these. And uh, I, I used a lot of opportunities when I got to work with some very famous people to put these stories in the book. And so I was like, I'm running out of famous people to, to talk to and run into. <laughs> well, there's always, you know, you, you can uh, always uh, run into some more uh, and yeah. get some more stories. Yeah. Um, what um, is the best way for someone who's listening to purchase your book? Once again, being new in the book world, you can you can buy it on Amazon. I found out we've sold a couple of weeks ago. We'd sold forty, even one in Italy, uh, and uh, but I don't know how that works. And so I just buy books, and and people email me, and they'll Venmo me, or they'll mail me a check, and uh, so. I'm on Facebook, Frank McMean, and uh, you can find me and send me a message or uh, uh, people will text me. Anyway. And if it's on, if it's on Amazon, we'll just put a link in the show notes so that people can click on it and go buy it. And then they'll have to seek you out on Facebook if they want an autograph copy. Yeah. Well, everyone that I send out, yeah, I'll, I'll sign it and write a little note to them. Um, And just, we just got a, five star rating on the book from favorite readers. And that was a neat thing. And so I think it's up for a, a couple of other competitions or, or uh, you're a, you're a writer. So you know this stuff more than I do, because this is all brand new to me. So it's up for some competition for things. I, so yeah, that's we'll, great. We'll know, we'll know more. I'll know more about that then. So. Yeah, that's great. Well, congratulations on the book, on the Thank PhD, you. on on everything you got going on. Uh, sounds like you have uh, some fantastic things happening, and I know you've inspired a lot of our uh, listeners. Uh, so we appreciate you. Well, thank you, Scott.
And thank you for what you do for Northwest Tennessee and, and uh, tourism and the economy. Uh, some great things are happening there and, and I'm, I'm proud to be part of West Tennessee. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you listeners who've joined us for this uh, interesting uh, discussion. Um, Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. If you'd like to plan an experience to Discovery Park of America for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.